Okay, now we're in section two of the notes, which is the graphing of the trigonometric functions. How many functions are we graphing? Well, six. We're going to graph the sine function, cosine function, tangent function, and then their reciprocals, the cotangent function, secant function, and cosecant function. Uh, I would say probably we should start simple with the sine and the cosine, but we do need to move forward into the tangent and the cotangent, yada, yada, yada. All right. So here's some questions to consider while you're doing these things over here is, you know, we're going to be doing, you know, certainly in the past when we did a section one, we basically stuck with really simple angles. It's so important to know the definitions of these functions because it's going to generate a graph. There is some confusion though. A lot of people are confused by, again, the letters. All right. We'll talk about that in more detail. All right. But you, you should, you know, some questions you should consider over here and you know, some of the things you're looking at, they, they give you pictures here. We'll talk about that. They ask about domain and range. They talk about that. But the bottom line is they give you pictures. And these are good pictures. All right. So this is a picture of the sine function. You know, this is a little video over there. Me talking through it. If you want to uh, listen to those videos, you can. Uh, this is a cosine function picture. We'll go through that at the whiteboard later. This is the tangent function. We'll go through that later. You notice it's got these little red lines over here. That's asymptotic behavior stuff you learned about in math 119. All right, same thing, you got asymptotes here. This is the cotangent function. Again, we'll talk through it. Again, there's videos over here if you wanna take a look at that. I'm seeing asymptotes again. Oh, these are tough ones over here, secant function. It's the reciprocal of the cosine function. I'm seeing asymptotes over there, not so bad. And this is cosecant function. Again, I'm seeing asymptotes. It's reciprocal of the sine, all right? I do talk about calculator use. Specifically, I talk about you know, using technology. And I like using technology. These graphs that were generated over here, I use technology to graph that, not, not by doing it by hand, but by using technology. I like using technology. The bottom line is technology is not gonna be useful unless you can get a rough idea what's happening by hand. And that's what we're trying to do, get a rough idea what's happening by hand, calculator usage. Okay, so the, my technique of graphing may differ, but I wanna be honest with you. If you've learned the 119 material with standardized translation, you'll have no problem. Unfortunately, it is difficult for a large number of students to understand the translation stuff that was taught at 119. But it's really the same thing. So what I'm gonna basically do is, I'm gonna look at our graphs. The same thing I did in Math 119, if you took me to 119. I'm looking at the graphs, I'm looking for characteristic features and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get those characteristic features in the children of the parents. Now, what are the parents? The sine function, cosine function, tangent function, cotangent function, cosecant function, and secant function. They're the parents. What are the parents? These are the parents. So when these parent curves, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at them and I'm going to be talking about five characteristics on those. If I get five characteristics down, I will be able to look at any child of, the, of those, those curves and look for five characteristics on the child. And we'll talk about the method for doing that, all right? We'll get to the whiteboard later. I'm just going through the notes at this point. All right, conventions, all right, phase shift. This can be very difficult to detect for a periodic function. Generally speaking, I don't talk about it, all right? But there are phase shifts. What does it mean? We're moving it left or right. What we are going to be talking about is the functions and the sine and cosine have an amplitude, and that's half the distance between the upper and the lower. We'll talk about that as we start doing examples. We're also going to talk about the period of a periodic function. And what does that mean to me? How long does it take to complete a full cycle of the function? How many cycles are there going to be? There could be an infinite number of cycles. We just want to know what's the cycle length of one complete cycle. We'll get to that when we get to it, all right? So I'm gonna switch over to the whiteboard. Just give me a moment to do so. And let me take a look. I'm plugging my computer in here, give me a second. All right, I just plugged it in. And of course, what am I looking at? The notes, all right, let's go back. Okay, so I'm looking at the notes now. I want to point out to you what I'm looking at. The first thing I'm looking at, and I'm going to blow it up for you, is the sine function. 
All right, so I'm gonna blow it up a little bit. And I'm gonna talk about it, all right? It says it's a label sign function. So what I'm looking at over there is I'm looking at what's called a partial graph of the sine function. The sine function goes on forever and ever. And the reason for that is we could rotate forever and ever and ever through all the angles, all right? So I wanna just remind you using different notation over here that when we did the sine function, what did we talk about? An X and a Y axis. But now I'm gonna talk about the A axis and the B axis. And then I'm gonna be talking about you know, we could rotate around and we did a little circle over here, not the best looking circle. All right, that's R and this is the point A, B and this is the angle theta. I wanna remind you, again, theta can be rotated forward, that's positive number over here or backwards, a negative number. We can keep doing this all day long though, the wheels in the bus go round and round. Question is, how's the sine function defined? Well, the sine of theta It's going to be the ratio B, which is the ordinate over the radius. Now, I hope you realize what's not changing in the problem. The radius isn't changing, so the B is changing. All right. Now, when I look at a graph, and it's going to confuse some students over here, this is the graph Y equals the sine of X. So X now is the angle. So what I want to do is I want to talk about really simple angles to deal with. And what angles do I want to deal with? I'll write them down for you. I think theta equals zero is easy. I think theta, well, what would the next one be? There's a lot of them. I'm going to say really simple would be 90 degrees. I'm going to say the next one for me, the really next easy one for me would be 180 degrees. And the next easy one for me would be 270 degrees. And the next easy one would be 360 degrees. I want to point out once I get to 360, I'm back at the beginning. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm back at the beginning. I'm back at the beginning. Here's the deal though. We shouldn't be using degrees. We should be using radian. Let's write this down. Zero, pi over two. By the way, if you can't do this, you really shouldn't be in this section. You should be studying the prior section. It's gonna be pi. It's gonna be three pi over two. And what's this gonna be over here? Two pi. Now you should have a rough idea that zero is zero. That's like rough, how could that, could that not be rough? Pi over two, roughly about 1.5. Pi, roughly around three point something. Three pi over two, you know, about four point something. You get the idea. Two pi is about six point something. You get an idea. Now, what's my goal over here? And, and again, if you have not studied the prior section, this is gonna be tough. You won't know where these numbers are coming from, but you should be able to do the sine of zero degrees. And what's that gonna be? Well, I know the definition of it. It's gonna be the B, which is the ordinate. Well, the ordinate is zero, so that's gonna be zero. That's simple. So now I can put a table over here. I'll put the table down for you. Table's X comma Y. And the angle's gonna be zero. And what's the Y coordinate gonna be? Well, the sine of zero, we know to be zero. I'm gonna plot that point for you. It's right here. This is a characteristic point. It is both an X intercept and a Y intercept. It's characteristic. All right, let's go to the next point. Next point I would like to go to is a sign of 90 degrees. Well, again, you would need to know the defining features of this. And what's gonna be ordinate, which is B over the radius, well, B equals R at 90 degrees. So that's gonna be the number one now. So what do I know now? At pi over two, that's 90 degrees, by the way, what number would I get the number one? Well, I'm gonna plot that point for you and tell you where it is. It's right here. All right, so we plot it this one and we plot this one. Now, let me repeat this. The first point zero, zero, that is an x-intercept and a y-intercept, and that's an important point, it's characteristic. The point pi over two comma one, looking at my picture, appears to be a relative maximum. It also is a relative, I'm sorry, it is also an absolute maximum for this curve. All right, let's keep going. What's the next point I'd go to? Probably 180. Because it's easy. By the way, I'm not saying I know what comes in between. We'll talk about that later. What do you get at 180? Well, looking at it, it's still the ordinate. The ordinate would be zero there. So I can write that point down. At 180, which is pi, what number would I get? I would get zero. I'll plot that point for you. Okay? So what do we have now? We have three points down. 
I'm going to claim there's really five characteristics to this picture over here to get one cycle of the graph. Let's keep going. And what am I going to keep going to? I guess I'll go to the sine of 270 degrees. Again, this comes from the prior section. What's B here? It's, it's actually minus R. So I would get a ratio of minus R over R, which would be minus one. Let me write that down for you. So at three pi over two, which is 270 degrees, by the way, what do I get? I would get minus one. I'm going to plot that point for you. All right, we're plotting one point at a time. Now, what do I know about that point? That point's a relative minimum. And in fact, it's global minimum as well. All right, let's go to the last point. And this is where the wheels on the bus will stop going round and round. And that's going to be a pi, two pi, I mean. What's the sign of two pi? Well, it's sign 360. Well, we're back at zero degrees again. It's going to be zero. Get zero over here. Let me plot that. All right, how many points do I have down? One, two, three, four, five. This is the parent. I'm going to claim this is one cycle of the curve. Now, why is that? If I keep going, it's going to repeat itself over and over again ad infinitum. This is one cycle down. If I need to draw two cycles down, I can do that. But right now, this is one cycle. Here's my problem, though. How do the dots connect together? You would have to know this definition over here to know how they connect together. What's happening? Well, if you're at zero and you get a pi over two, what's happening to B? And I want to point out what I mean by that. Let me just point that out to you. If I do this from zero degrees to pi over two, the B is going up in value. It would take on a maximum over there, by the way. So let me kind of draw that in. And I, I know it's tough to connect things together, but I'll, I'll draw that in for you. Now, when you're at the 90 degrees, which is pi over two, and you're going to pi, which is 180 degrees, what's the B doing? It's going down in value and it's going down towards zero. So something like this over here, it's going down. Now, someone says, oh, you're not plotting points, you're disconnecting it together. Well, you're right about that, but that's exactly what you did in Math 119. You make connections based on reason. Now, what happens to uh, the B? By the way, the R is always R, it's always a positive number. What happens to the B when you go beyond the 180? It starts to become negative. Where does it become most negative? At three pi over two. Then what happens? Well, the B is still negative at 270 degrees or three pi over two, but it starts to go back towards zero. All right, I'm gonna write the five points down for you. This point over here is zero, zero. This point over here is pi over two, comma one. This point over here is pi, comma zero. This point over here is three pi over two, comma minus one. And this point over here is two pi comma zero. What points did I put down? Min maxes and the three x-intercepts and also a y-intercept, five points. You need to know this curve because it's gonna have children. It's children are gonna look the same. We'll go through the method when we get there, but right now, if you don't know the parent, you're not gonna know the children. Let's keep going, go to the next page. That's covered. I'm gonna do the cosine function, so over here. And then we'll do the next one up, okay? All right, let's take a look. This is the picture of the cosine. It's clearly labeled six, cosine. Same story. Wheels on the bus go round and round. Whoops, sorry about that. Let's put this down. I'm still gonna use A and B. And, oh, sorry about that. Touching too many buttons here. My circle. Radius n, point, this is b, I did it again. That's b and this is a comma b, all right? This is the angle theta and the cosine of theta is defined as, well, let's see. It's defined as the abscissa, which in this case is a over r. All right, we knew that from last time. Then someone says, oh, I wonder what the easy values are to evaluate this at. And my claim over here, it's just like the sign. The easy values are going to be, well, where theta is equal to zero degrees, the theta equals 90 degrees, the theta equals 180 degrees, the theta equals 270 degrees, and the theta equals 360 degrees. Let me point out again, the story is really the same story. Well, we're starting at zero degrees, we're rotating, 
we're getting to 360 degrees, we're back at the beginning. It keeps repeating itself over and over again. No matter what direction you're going, forward, backwards, it's always going in the same pattern of numbers. Let's put down the radian measures because that's what we really need to graph. That's gonna be zero. And again, if you're struggling with this, you're really not struggling with this section, you're struggling with the prior section. You wanna go back to that. Going forward, having a base is really gonna be bad news for you. All right, again, you should have an understanding that zero's zero, that's not too bad. Pi over two is like one point something. Pi is three point something. Three pi over two is four point something. And two pi is six point something. All right, you get the idea. So, you know, what's my objective over here? My objective is to do the cosine of zero degrees, cosine of 90 degrees. No, I'm not memorizing, I'm thinking. And we'd like you to think as well. Whoops. Well, how's the cosine defined? A, well, that's the abscissa. And at zero degrees, the abscissa would be equal to R. So the ratio would be one. At 90, the abscissa is zero. And zero divided by R would be zero. At 180 degrees, right, the abscissa would be minus one. So I get minus one. I'm sorry, uh, minus R. So minus R over R would be minus one. I'm sorry. At 270, the abscissa is zero. Not zero. That's pretty simple. And back to cosine 360, abscissa is equal to the R, so the ratio would be one. All right, let me go back over here. Pretty got a pretty good understanding now that I could actually do this now. All right, little table up here. We'll put this down, and it's the cosine function. And we're talking about X and Y now. What's X? X is the angle. What are the angles? Zero, pi over two, pi, we'll fill in the table in a second, three pi over two, and two pi. All right, what are we doing? Y equals cosine of the angle X now. So what's cosine of zero? It's one. What's cosine of pi over two? Zero. What's cosine of pi? Minus one. We'll plot these points later. What's cosine of three pi over two? Minus one. I'm, I'm sorry, zero. I, I'm, I'm daydreaming. What's cosine of two pi? One. Let's plot these points for you. On the graph, we provide graph to you for a reason. We want to give you good pictures, all right? The good pictures of the machine did this. So zero one's here. I'm just plotting points. The next point I see is pi over two, zero. Well, I guess it's right over there. Then pi minus one. And then we get three pi over two, zero. Nicely spaced, aren't they? And then two pi one. All right, now we have to tell you how they connect together. If you think about it, as the wheels and the bus go round and round, we're going from zero to 360 degrees, zero degrees to 360 degrees or zero to two pi. I'm looking at the abscissa. And what's the abscissa doing? Well, between zero and 90 degrees, the abscissa is getting smaller. And then between 90 degrees and 180 degrees, the abscissa is getting more negative until it is that minus one thing, ratio, by the way. Then when I'm between 180 and 270, it's still negative, but it's going back towards the zero. Okay, as we're at 270 to 360, the abscissa becomes positive and it's going in the ratio, it's going towards one. All right, this is one cycle of it. I'm gonna graph, not graph, I'm gonna tell you what the points are. This point over here is zero comma one. This point over here is pi over two comma zero. This point over here is going to be pi comma minus one. This point over here is three pi over two comma zero. And this point over here is two pi comma one. All right, what do we just draw? One cycle of the cosine curve. That's all we've done. This is the parent. This parent will have children. Just like when you did 119, you were given a parent graph and then you're asked to graph a translated graph, which I call the child graph in 119. Same thing here. We're going to have children of these parents, and they're going to look just like the parent. Now, someone's going to claim, oh, the sine and the cosine look the same. They do. They really are the same. What's happened over here? There's been a phase shift between the two. And again, when we get to what Denny's, we'll talk about what that phase shift is. But right now, let's not worry about it. What are we worried about? The five characteristic points. That's what we're worried about, the five characteristic points. All right, so what I'm gonna do now, 
I mean, next one. Next one, a little more complicated. It's the tangent function. So I think you probably know what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw my wheel again, my, my circle. Put that down over here. Wheels on the bus go round and round. I'm going to put my R in over here, my theta, and my A over B. That's my point. This is the abscissa A, and this is the ordinate B. The tangent of theta is defined as being the ordinate B over the abscissa, which is A. Here comes trouble. Someone said, I don't know what, what to start with. Well, I'm really going to start with the same thing. I go over here. Some nice easy values. And I think, you know, we, we talked about like really five easy values. And I want to stick with the five easy values. All right. And again, someone says, how do you know what the easy values are? I guess by doing section one of the notes, I know the easy values. Oops, sorry about that. I need to do that. Whoops. I'm going to pat easy thetas for you. Now, one of the easy thetas I'm going to talk about is actually zero degrees. I think it's easy. I'm going to say another easy theta for me is going to be pi over four. And the reason that the tangent of pi over four is really simple. How do I know that? By covering section one. Now, of course, someone says, I wonder what the next one after that is. And it's not an easy one. It's going to be pi over two. You know what? I should use degrees. I'm sorry, because I know you guys are not familiar with this yet. I'm going to say 45 degrees. And I apologize. I'll put the radian down later. Zero, pi over four. I should speak degrees first. It's so true. This is pi over two. Now, I want to point out that I can do the tangent of zero degrees, pretty simple, just zero. How do I know that? I look at my picture. I know its definition. The ordinate zero there, so it's got to be zero over A. That's not a problem. Now, if I did the tangent of 45 degrees, no, I'm not trying to memorize. Reference triangle 45. The ratio would be one over root two divided by one over root two. That would be one. Then if I did the tangent of 90 degrees, I've got big troubles. I'll tell you why I got big troubles. If you go to 90 degrees, what happens? The abscissa becomes zero. So this over here is what's known as going to be asymptotic behavior. That's something you did in math 119. Now, by the way, I'm getting to a danger zone there. So I'm going to go backwards, back away from that. So 45, zero, I'm going to go to minus 45 degrees. And yes, you should back away now. What are you doing going in the other direction from the zero? What would that ratio give you? Minus one, and then back away a little bit more to the dangerous area, minus 90 degrees. What would that give you? Oh, division by zero again, another asymptote. All right, let me go back to my tangent curve. We discussed that from the prior section. And I'm gonna to start to write this down now for you. And what am I gonna write down? Y equals the tangent of X. Remember, we're in radian mode. I'm gonna put my table down for you, X and Y. I'm going to put those five values down that I just did before. Zero, minus pi over four, pi over four, minus pi over two, and pi over two. All right. So what do I know about this? I know asymptote occurred here. Asymptote occurred here. What happened at zero? I get zero. What happened at minus pi over four? I get minus one. What happened at pi over four? I got one. I'm going to plot three points now. Zero, zero. That one's done. Next one is going to be pi over four comma one. That's right over here. The next one I'm going to put down is the asymptote. What's the asymptote going to be? X equals pi over two. That's the asymptote. All right, I got this one, this one, and this one. Let's go to minus pi over four. That's going to be right over here. That's minus one, minus pi over four, minus one. What happens over there? Another asymptote, x equals minus pi over two. And here comes a problem for a lot of students. Say, I wonder how that connects together. 
Well, we're hoping you have some recollection back to Math 119 that you know there's a connection between these guys over here. But I got to go back to my definition of what the connection is going to be. And let's just briefly talk about that. So as I'm, I'm, I'm doing this over here and I'm rotating towards the 90 degrees, what's happening over here? Well, I want to point out what's happening over here. We're getting a ratio of B over A. So, you know, B is getting larger, but A is getting smaller. They're both positive, by the way. So the thing has got to be getting bigger. Now, where is A going towards zero? So this is blowing up without bound. So I said, it, it appears to be somewhat reasonable that looking between zero and 90 degrees, let me go back over this over here, I'm starting to realize, well, you know, the division gets, you know, the, 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 the B gets bigger, but the A gets smaller. They're both positive numbers. So it's asymptotic and it's moving up in value. So let me put that down for you. Again, I'm not saying that we, we know exactly what those numbers are yet, but I'm gonna trace them over, asymptotic. All right, now, if you go below the zero towards the minus 90 degrees, what's happening is the abscissa is still positive, but now the ordinate is becoming negative. And what's happening, the abscissa is going towards zero, so we're going towards minus infinity now. All right, let me label these points for you. This point over here is zero, zero. This point over here is pi over four comma one. This point over here is pi over four, I'm sorry, minus pi over four comma minus one. I just did it again, I'm sorry. Minus pi over four comma minus one. All right, asymptotes might take some thinking. We would like you to think through that. So someone says, does that have five characteristics? It does. What are the characteristics? Three points, one, two, three, an ending asymptote and a beginning asymptote. Ending asymptote, beginning asymptote. What do we notice about this? A lot of symmetry. All right, let's go to the next one. And again, we'll get to examples later. Let's go to the next one. Cotangent, not so bad. All right, blow it up. Wheels in the bus go round and round. Let's write this down for you. And again, I, I know these pictures are kind of lousy when I draw them on here for you, but I like to use A and B. This is the theta. And let's go through some angles now, okay? So, so the, oh, I write the definition down. Cotangent of theta is gonna be what now? It's gonna be abscissa A over the ordinate B. It's a reciprocal tangent. So what, what are the easy ones to do? I'm gonna point out, you really have to understand that this is a problem A over B. So I'm looking for angles where I know A over B. And I know easy ones. And I'm gonna go through that with you now. All right, so I'm gonna put a table down for you. Now I mean, I'll write them down for you. I'm gonna say this is an easy one. I'm gonna say 45 degrees is an easy one. I'm going to say 90 degrees is an easy one. I'm going to say, let's see what the next would be. It looks like going by 45, right? Now that's the easy pattern to this. So 0, 45, 135. And then theta would be 180 degrees. Right? I'm going to say they're easy for me. I'm going to put it easy for you as well. And so we're a little bit, put the radian down for you. 0, pi over 4. And again, if you're struggling with this, you actually should be back in the section 1. These are really nicely spaced problems, by the way. All right, here comes the tough part. Why is it tough? I got to do this over here. What do I got to do? I got to do cotangent of zero degrees. I have to do the cotangent of 45 degrees. And this all comes from the prior section, by the way. Sorry about that. And then I got to do the cotangent of 90 degrees. I have to do the cotangent of 135 degrees. I have to do the cotangent, uh, let's see if I got 0, 45, 90, 130, and 180 now, right? Well, let's keep it easy. The cotangent 45 degrees, what is it going to be? Well, that's pretty simple. I'll be honest with you. Why is it simple? I'm looking at it, and the ratio there would be, you know, 1 over root 2 divided by 1 over root 2 would be 1. Okay, now I'm going to look at 90 degrees. 
I'm, again, I'm, I'm going easy. And you might say, so I like different numbers. You use the numbers you like, I'm going easy. Uh, you want to use Kaplan for this over here. Cotangent of 90. Well, the abscissa would be zero there, wouldn't it? Not zero. That's easy. Again, I'm looking at this definition over here. The cotangent of 135. Well, now I'm in a negative territory. All right. So it's going to be, it's going to be a negative ratio, negative ratio of minus one. Really simple. Now, someone says, why'd you pick zero? Why don't you even go near that? And that's going to be difficult. Because when I do that, what do I get? The ordinate B becomes zero. So this is asymptotic. Now, if I go to 180, the ordinate becomes zero again, and it's going to be asymptotic. All right, let's go to our picture, and I'm ready for it. All right, this is our picture. And what's just a picture of y equals the cotangent of x. And yes, this is going to take time and effort on your part to master what I'm doing, x and y. And what do I do? Well, I hope you realize I did do degrees, but I want to put the radian down now. So it's going to be 0, pi over 4. Let's see, pi over 2. Let's see, 3 pi over 4. And then pi. That's not so bad. At 0, we had an asymptote. At pi, we had an asymptote. At pi over 2, we had 0. We just did that before. And at pi over 4, we had 1. And at 3 pi over 4, we had minus 1. Let's plot our points. Let's do this one first. Pi over 4, 1. Pi over 2, 0. 3 pi over 4, minus 1. I got these three points down. Let's put our asymptotes down. I got an asymptote over here. What's that asymptote? X equals 0. What's this asymptote over here? X equals pi. How does it connect together? Let's look at it. Between 0 and 90, or 0 and pi over 2, what's happening? Well, if I look at it, it's the ratio A over B. What's happening? A is getting smaller, and it's going towards 0. Now, if you want the other direction, when I say the direction towards the angle zero, it's going to blow up. Got that covered. All right, let's go between 90 degrees and 180. What do I know about that? It's still the ratio A over B. A is the abscissa, B is the ordinate. What do I know? Well, the ordinate is positive, but the abscissa is negative. So the ratio is always going to be negative. And what's happening over there? Well, as I go towards, you know, when I, when I look at the ordinate, when I go towards 180, the ordinate goes towards zero. So it's going to blow up, but towards minus infinity. I put my points down for you. And again, it's going to be five characteristics. Pi over four, comma one, pi over two, comma zero. And this point over here is three pi over four comma minus one. And of course the asymptotes are already listed for you. All right, now, I, I gotta be honest with you. It, it, it's overwhelming for some to say, oh, when is this gonna stop? Well, we did four graphs already. And I'm gonna point out what these graphs are over here. The, the way I do them might be different than other teachers do them, but I wanna point out that this is the reciprocal of the cosine function. That's all it is. So let me write this down for you. This is the reciprocal of the cosine function. So what I like to do is draw the picture of the cosine function in. I'm going to do that with a dashed line. I think I've done this before. That's the graph of that. OK, that's all it is. Could I extend that graph? Yeah, I could go on forever. I want to start talking about points on the cosine function. And I'm going to do that one point at a time. This point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point. See if we can do it. So what's this first point over here? That looks pretty simple. That's 0 comma, one. What's this point? 
pi over two comma zero. What's this point? Let's see, zero pi over two, that's gotta be pi now, right? We're just counting, minus one. What's this point? Three pi over two comma zero. What's this point? Two pi comma one. What's this point? I know it's tough. We're just counting though. What are we counting by? Pi over two. Zero, pi over two, two pi over two, three pi over two, four pi over two, five pi over two, comma zero. All right, what's this point over here? It should be simple. It's minus pi over two, comma zero. So someone says, why did you do the cosine? In? If I know the cosine, I know what its reciprocal looks like. All right. Now I'm going to do point by point reciprocals. I'm going to do this in red now. I'm going to talk about this curve over here. This is the curve you want to get. Oops. What's this point here? That's pretty simple. The reciprocal of one is one. So this point's still gonna be zero, one. What's this point over here? One, what's the reciprocal minus one? It's still minus one. What's this point over here? Well, it's gonna be two pi, that's my x value. And what's the y value? It's the reciprocal of one, which is one. One, two, three points, right? All right, and let's talk about the asymptotes. And I'll tell you why the asymptotes over here. What are we looking at? We're looking at this point, this point in the cosine curve. What's your reciprocal of zero? It's an asymptote. So I can write the asymptote down now. Let's put that down for you. This asymptote over here is x equals pi over two. This asymptote here is x equals minus pi over two. This asymptote here is x equals three pi over two. And this asymptote over here, I'm sorry about that, is x equals five pi over two, all right? I know this is difficult. I do want to encourage you. This is not something you're going to get in a matter of seconds. This is going to take effort on your end. As we go through examples, we hope that effort pays off. Effort is on your end though, not on my end. All right, let's go to the next curve, which is going to be the cosecant. And what I'm going to claim is something to do with the sine function, all right? Put this over here. I'm going to graph the sine function and the sine function. Let me put that in yellow this time. Looks like this. All right, I think I know the points. I'm looking at it. Let's do one point at a time. What's that point gonna be? Again, you would need to know the sine function to know that point. It's gonna be pi over two, comma one. What's this point over here gonna be? Let's see, zero, one, two, three pi over two, comma minus one. Let's do this point over here. All right, let's see if we can do it. Kind of looking at it, I mean, I'm saying that, you know, it, it, the sine function has a period of two pi, right? So we'd expect this thing to repeat itself every two pi. Remember we did sine function, it started at zero, ended at two pi. So the big question is, what's pi over two plus, I wanna point out what we're doing over here. We're just moving and we're just finishing a cycle, what's cycle at? Two pi. Yeah, you need to know basic arithmetic. Gone over two, that's gonna be five pi over two. So what's this point over here? Five pi over two comma one. Now what are the asymptotes gonna be? Well, it's where the sine function takes on at zero because the, 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 the uh, reciprocal of zero would be uh, uh, the, you know, the, the thing's blowing up. So X equals zero x equals pi and x equals two pi, the asymptotes. 
Again, we go through examples. Hopefully this stuff will be more, uh, it'll gel more. I know it's difficult, all right? We're gonna start simple though. We'll do sine, we'll do cosine. Then we'll move on the tangent, cotangent. And we're doing the children, by the way. Let me repeat this. If you don't know the parent, you don't know the child. You must understand what we did here before we can think about graphing. All right, as I mentioned before, calculator use, uh, just you know, briefly in a calculator, uh, you might be confused by this, but if you're using an ancient calculator, you're not gonna see the, uh, you know, the cotangent, the secant or the secant. If we're using a computer algebra system, you'll see that though. But the bottom line is, I will talk about using a graphing utility to do that. And I'll be talking about using Wolfram Alpha at least I think I will. Who knows? Maybe I'll forget. I will be talking about Sage. At least I think I will. And I'll be talking about an application called Grapher. Now, let me repeat this. If you go to NJIT, they'll just talk about MATLAB. I got to be honest with you, though. You really need a lot of tools to work with mathematics. I'm going to say Wolfram Alpha is not bad, Sage is not bad, and Grapher is not bad. Are there other tools out there? A ton of them. You feel free to use what you want to do, uh, what you want to use though. Don't think I have to tell you what you're going to do. All right, my method for graphing, and I want to be honest with you, it basically relies upon what you guys have done in Math 119. All right, now sometimes I can't remember anything of 119. Well, understandably so. All right, but you did a lot of stuff in 119. All right, what did you do? You took what's called a parent graph or a simple graph and you translated it, you used some translation rules, all right? So the basic translation rules, you had something like this over here and it's really kind of tough. So what I do is everything boils down to five characteristics. Everything boils down to five characteristics, whether it's a sine, the cosine, tangent, or the reciprocal functions, all of them depend on five characteristics, and I'll go through that. I do want to point out, as we went through the characteristics, you should notice something about equally spaced points. And that's really important. They were equally spaced. We will talk about it as we go through graphing them. Let me keep going. We talk about conventions. I do want to briefly talk about this a little bit. And what I'm going to talk about is phase shift. Generally, I don't ask the question. And I don't think WebAssign is asking either. Horizontal shift for a periodic function. Every function we gave you was periodic. It kept repeating itself over and over again. Why is that? The wheels on the bus go round and round. It's often hard to see the phase shift. It really is. It's really hard to see it. The reason for that is when you take a periodic function and shift it left to right, it could sit on top of itself. And you don't know what it's been shifted by. That can happen. That's why I don't talk about phase shift. Amplitude I do talk about, but there's only two functions that have an amplitude. That's gonna be the sine and cosine. And what's the amplitude? It's the distance, I'm sorry, it's half the distance between the top and the bottom, the mins and maxes. All right, we'll talk about that. It's a positive number, by the way. The period of a periodic function is how long does it take to complete one cycle. How long does it take to complete one cycle? Typically what I do there, and I go through the work with you, begin, end, how long is its life? How do I do that end minus begin will tell me the length of it. We're gonna go through examples. As I go through examples though, I'm hoping you can follow what we've done. For example, number one is a sine function. What do I have to do? Five characteristic points. And we'll go through that. Thank you.